Welcome to the Hidden Bookcase. Come through and get cosy. Pick a book, your favourite book, that's the one that opens this room. Inside you'll find a warm fire, a loving cat, and a wide skylight to the stars. And a dangerously high to be red pile. I'm Morgan, I use they them pronouns, and I am a self lobotomized necromancer. I'm Soren, I use he him pronouns, and I am a grumpy highwayman turned barista. And I'm Elle, I use they them pronouns, and I am a teenage crime lord. Soren and I have been friends for over a decade, and the two of us are always swapping books. Usually we recommend each other our favourite books and talk about them on the show, but today join us for a chat beside the fire about disability representation in science fiction and fantasy. So we are joined today by Elle. Hi. Hello. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's lovely to have you. And this episode is for Disability Pride Month as well. This will be coming out at the very end of Disability Pride Month, so I suppose I hope everyone who's listening to this has had a very nice Disability Pride Month. I hope I have. Yeah. By this point. (laughs) It's going to be a long one, I'm sure. (laughs) Our future selves included in that statement, yes. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So, we're here today to chat about disability rap in fantasy and science fiction. That is my thing. That is what I do. I love disability rap in sci-fi and fantasy, mainly because a lot of people have told me, both in real life and on TikTok, that they don't believe that disabled people can be in fantasy what yeah (laughs) they're like they didn't have disabled people back in those days they just died what in what days are you talking about in a fantasy world (laughs) yeah first of all (laughs) there's so much to unpack here second off there's the whole thing of like the first sign of civilization was like a healed fever yeah there have been disabled people longer than we've been recording history what what are you talking about exactly since the dawn of time historically surely there was probably a higher rate i mean i suppose there'd be some disabilities like celiac disease drawing on my own situation where i would definitely have just died as a child (laughs) (laughs) if i'd been born a bit earlier but then polio yeah much less prevalent now that left many people disabled historically smallpox could leave you blind that's such a bizarre take i'm so confused yeah and then when it comes to sci-fi you have the exact opposite where people are like oh well in a true scientific utopian future no one would be disabled because we could eugenics our way out of it oh god (laughs) and it's like you do realize that eugenics is a bad thing don't you (laughs) I think you're saying dystopia, if you're saying eugenics. People are all like, oh, eugenics is bad until disability is involved. And then suddenly they're like, maybe. Why does do get crossed? I feel like there's more disability representation in fantasy fiction, at the moment at least, because people don't really see disabled people existing in contemporary fiction because it's easier to put disabled people in without really thinking about it like it's a lot of accidental representation of like there was a war so someone's missing an eye and stuff like that someone's missing a leg and so you get a lot more accidental representation as opposed to purposeful representation but still it's nice to see we gravitate towards fantasy for a reason maybe yeah i think you definitely see more of it in fantasy and i think a lot of that is because of the stigma around disability seems lessened when it comes to fantasy because they're like oh yeah, it's totally fine that someone loses a limb in a war, but if someone loses a limb because of meningitis when they were a child, that's weird. I think people project more of the ableism that they feel onto characters in contemporary fiction than they do in fantasy fiction, because they can explain it away in fantasy fiction, kind of like you said, but in contemporary fiction, they're forced to reckon with the fact that these are real people who could exist in the world. I can excuse breaking the Geneva Convention, but I draw the line at people being actually disabled. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I was just rereading The End of Peter Darling by Austin Chan, actually, because I couldn't remember whether James, Captain Hook's real-life counterpart, if you like, was disabled in the real world in that retelling, which he was. But there's this funny exchange between him and Peter where Peter's like, oh, I didn't cut that off then. And he's like, unless you were conspiring with my mother prior to my birth. I don't think you did, no. (laughs) It's interesting that even in that context, it got made into that myth of being something more dramatic and being put into that fantastical context Mm. when it was just like, nah, I'm I'm just like this. Mm. I did love that exchange. I was born like this. Are you okay? It's so funny. You made that one up front. (laughs) I think as well, when it comes to fantasy, there's so much more scope to look at what disability looks like in different worlds. And so... Mm. Some of the things that I've covered for magic and disabilities, like a lot of people probably wouldn't think are disabilities. I've talked about in the Grishaverse when people lose their Grisha powers or their Grisha powers change because Grisha powers are connected to your health. That is a disability. If you were part of the Second Army, you'd lose your job and lose your housing if your Grisha powers changed. So I think that there's a lot of 
discussion in fantasy of disability, but also a lot of people aren't picking up on it. Mm. When I try to get people into the Grisha verse, I always go from the very off. Alina is disabled because she's suppressing her power to the point where it's making her physically sick and she's been physically sick her whole life. But people just look at it and go, oh, it's that classic, I'm not like other girls, I'm not pretty. But it's like an actual physical disability, which people just gloss over as like YA fiction written by women, which makes me so angry because Lee Bardugo is a disabled author who is writing about her own experiences. People just don't get that. Lee Bardugo is someone who gets it right every single time when it comes to disability representation. Wylan is so wonderfully written. Kaz is so wonderfully written. The way that Nina deals with her powers being changed at the end of Six of Crows is wonderfully written and a brilliant allegory for disability. She talks about it on so many different levels, like people who gain disabilities magically, people who have disabilities that we have in the real world. I want more people to do it the way that Lee Bardugo does it. <laughs> I'm also a huge fan of allegory type representations of disability because I think there's just so much to be had there in terms of universality. Losing your magic can speak to someone who's lost the ability to walk or suddenly got chronic fatigue syndrome or anything and you can still see yourself reflected there which I think is great. But then I was watching a video by Eucalyptus Girl on YouTube who's a disabled vlogger and she was talking about this factor of when I look at fantasy fiction and the only thing that I see is characters who for example are disabled in that they don't have magic. The only way that I can connect to that narrative is as their character without magic or as the character without powers. So I'm not seeing any representation of myself getting to do the thing that obviously you want to do as a fantasy reader, which is imagine doing magic. I hadn't thought about it from that point of view before. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And I think it's something that the Greenbone Saga by Fonda Lee explores fantastically, because there are some people who don't have an affinity for Jade and using Jade. She discusses how they're treated by society, the ways that they're ostracised, the way that people who care for them are ostracised. That's something that I wish more books that had mm-hmm. treating being magicless as a disability. I wish they discussed that more because it is something that socially ostracizes you and under the social model of disability disables you. Yeah, this is a non-book example, but I was really disappointed when that kind of got dropped in Legend of Korra. They had changed the society to the point where if you were a bender, you were getting better jobs. And then there was that discussion about non-benders are kind of disabled in this situation. Kind of just died, which is a little bit sad. A person who does this really well, actually, is Sara El Arifi in The Final Strife. Spoilers for The Final Strife, but there's a whole class of people who are mutilated at birth. And it's supposedly because they had an uprising, but it's actually because they are the original magic users and they are being deliberately disabled so that other people can use magic and they can be oppressed. It was really interesting to see how able-bodied people using it as a weapon. That was something I really liked about The Final Strife because it is something that happens a lot when countries are colonised, when people are subjugated by the people in power. Mass disabling events happen. And the government doesn't want to deal with them. They don't want to look after the people who they have disabled. It's just fantastically explored by that book. You made the point, I think it was in one of your videos about Godkiller, how often the fact that fantasy wars are mass disabling events does get overlooked. So it is really cool to actually see that being taken into account because if there's battles, etc., famines, disease. Yeah, it's like you'll see YA protagonists who it's like, I've been starving since the age of two. And it's like, no one in your family has any kind of muscle deficiency problems. None of you developed, like, I don't know, anemia. (laughs) No one developed a disability from starving for, like, your entire lifetime. Even if it wasn't in your lifetime, it can pass on a generation. Those legacies of disability should really be in those kinds of settings, but they're just not there. Absolutely, yeah. Dystopians, where it's like, we live in this horribly smoggy town near the factory, but nobody has lung issues. It makes me think of Dragonfall by L.R. Lamb. It's interesting that it's post-pandemic fiction because it's set post-pandemic in this fantasy world. And it was recognised as a mass disabling event where people have like got lots of hearing loss and stuff like that. Seeing that, seeing communities that were created inside this fantasy world from this mass disabling event, but then also how the government was just treating it like it hadn't happened. And there was this huge stigma about like, oh, if you were infected, then now you're a terrible person and we avoid you because you're a pariah. And it's like, that's a bit too close to home, but it's really, really well written and it's such like an interesting exploration. That's exactly what happened post-COVID. COVID is still going on, but, you know, the government doesn't care about that. I felt the same way about Hell Followed With Us because it was very obvious when reading Hell Followed With Us that it's hugely inspired by the pandemic 
and the people who became disabled through the pandemic. But it also has like such brilliant conversations about Christian attitudes towards disability, especially evangelical Christians can sometimes get pretty horrible <laughs> and pretty ableist. Do you guys think we're seeing more disability representation because of COVID? Now we are at that stage where things that were inspired in the lockdowns are now coming out. So I don't think I'd made that connection, but now that I'm thinking about it, I mean, maybe it's a coinciding thing that there has also just been more activism, even in the years leading up to COVID. And it's just that perfect storm. I would say we're seeing a lot more pandemic fiction. We're seeing a lot of people realising how easy it is to become disabled. A lot of people who didn't realise that it is one accident, a couple of years of ill health, a couple of weeks of ill health, and suddenly your life is changed. Suddenly your government doesn't care about you. Mm. And suddenly people around you think lesser of you. I think a lot of people have realised how close they are to suddenly becoming marginalised on many levels. And so a lot of people are not only exploring that more, but are more open to hearing stories from people who have been going through that for the years before COVID as well. Yeah, gosh, I mean, I wonder how much I haven't actually looked into how the stat changed, because I mean, it's supposed to be 20%, but then most people will become disabled at some point during their lifetime. So I'm wondering if it's still 20%. It's probably not. It's probably higher now. The percentage will be going up as things like climate change continues to happen as well. That's also extremely true, yeah. Climate change is also a mass disabling event. Yeah, and then particularly in the global south, that's going to be worse. Definitely. Jumping it back to books as well, there's something that I really loved about the second book in the Broken Blade series by Melissa Blair. It's so good. I love it so much. And I love Melissa so much. And in that book, as well as discussing colonialism being a mass disabling event, she talks about the effects of colonialism on the environment and how that in turn makes people disabled and affects disability and communities and communities' attitudes towards disabled people. It's so good. I remember when I read the first book in that series, just reading how Melissa writes the main character and the world building and everything was just so stunning really well-rounded Kira's struggles with like alcoholism and stuff like that was just so well done how it affected her throughout the book and was a form of disability even though people wouldn't necessarily think of it usually like that it's something that I've had conversations with Melissa about because we are friends about how a lot of people don't see alcoholism as a disability when it very much is because it medically changes your body, especially if you've been an alcoholic for years. It also comes with a huge amount of social stigma. A lot of people are not willing to hear alcoholics when they say they need help. A lot of people have very certain ideas on how you deal with alcoholism and how you recover from alcoholism. And if you deviate from people's ideas, then you all get demonised. And I've seen that in reviews for A Broken Blade of people saying, I didn't like the way that Kira recovered because it's not the way that I think alcoholics should recover. Being disabled in the book community is a whole different kettle of fish because you're trying to get people to read books with disabled protagonists and understand our perspectives and our lives. But then at the same time, you've got to decide when you're going to fight people who read those books and have the worst takes on them. Yeah, can't fight everyone. Yeah. Don't have the spoons. Don't have the spoons. (laughs) And what are people's pet peeves? What's the thing that you keep seeing that you're like, good God? Oh. Or is it even just that I'm not seeing it and that's, that's my pet peeve? I see a lot, but I feel like I'm attuned to looking for them, mm-hmm. you know, because yeah. I know that a lot of people aren't looking for them. So I feel like I'm clued in so I can make people know what they're looking for. In terms of pet peeves, though, I think changelings is probably up there mm. because a lot of people don't know that it can often be used harmfully. Reading Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia of Fairies was a time and not a good one. <laughs> Magical cure, I think, will always be my biggest pet peeve. That's an interesting one in the way that I feel like I hear a lot of people say the same thing about the magical gender reassignment for trans characters and in the way that those kind of relate. It can be terrible. Cough, cough, wrath goddessing. I was going to say, sometimes, yes, dislike it. Her Majesty's Royal Coven, no one's allowed to say bad things about Her Majesty's Royal Coven ever. (laughs) 
It's interesting because when you are a disabled reader, you're going into books sort of looking for representation just subconsciously. So I have a lot of books on my list of books with disabled characters in it, which most people wouldn't think of as books with disabled characters in them because I've gone, I recognize that experience as one that I've had. So I'm going to read that character as disabled, even if it's not completely textual. More textual disabilities is my pet peeve. I need more. But also I need non-disabled readers to not be like, I mean, that's not a disability or be like, "Mm, I don't see it that way because I see it that way and I'm disabled. Therefore, I'm correct. That is the way it works. I feel like it's a multifaceted issue in that people conceive of disability in a very limited way. You say disabled and people immediately picture a wheelchair user as opposed to something like needing glasses is arguably a disability and that you need an aid to see. And then on the other hand, I think people often just conceive of it as such an inherently negative thing. I was reading a Twitter thread recently, actually, and it was just about the Owl House. The protagonist of that gets briefly half petrified. And somebody was like, oh, it'd be interesting if she then was deaf on her left hand side and blind on her left hand side because she was turned to stone. And then someone was like, oh, no, that would suck because it would be really sad. I don't want that because she's been through enough. And I was like, Ugh. like, I can see where that instinct comes from. But it was just so it was like, oh, that would immediately be this terrible, tragic thing as opposed to it would be more representation and it would be something that she would learn to navigate. That brings me on to an interesting point that I've been thinking about a lot lately. And I know you guys have just done a whole month of cosy fantasy as of when we're filming this. I think a lot about where disabled people fit into cosy fantasy. Currently, there's not a huge amount. There are a couple of books and graphic novels. Mooncakes is a notable one. But I feel like a lot of people don't view disability as cosy, especially like chronic pain or chronic illness. They don't see that as cosy. And so it feels like people are deliberately not making space for disability and cosy fantasy a lot of the time. I feel like it's the perfect place to have disabled characters because you don't have to deal with war and stuff like that. It's like we're just vibing. This is the perfect place to actually like have the time to explore how a disabled person exists at home, at work, through a fantasy lens. It's like the perfect genre. I completely agree. I think it comes from kind of what we were alluding to earlier. People think disabled people are just depressing, especially people who use mobility aids day to day, especially wheelchairs and canes, and they don't want to look at them and they feel like they can't be comfortable if they're witnessing a disabled person, which is just ridiculous. Is that disfigured by Amanda Lodo? It is disfigured. I was going to say, the way that she phrased it was, it is inconceivable to so many that someone could be disabled and also happy. Yes. But yeah, I think that's very true, because I think obviously cosy fantasy is the happy endings genre. So I think people have that mental block, especially if it's a lifelong disability. If you can have murder and the mafia and still call it a cosy fantasy, you can have disabled characters. <laughs> In fairness, Viv does seem to have chronic back pain. So I guess Legends of Lattes does. I kind of wanted a little bit more from that, actually. It kind of seemed to be like a thing that she was completely ignoring. And I was hoping for someone to be like, have you considered any way to manage your pain? But it kind of just sort of gets dropped. As a barista with back pain, would like to have seen more of that, please. Show me all of the different things that could be put in place, you know? Show me a bench or a seat that you can sit on. Get a mobility aid, have a back brace. I got banned on live on TikTok the other day because I was talking about disability. Oh no. Which was a bit of a nightmare. I was doing an interview with Melissa for the release of Shadow Crown. I was talking about how you're only not disabled until society tells you you are under the social model of disability. Mm -hmm. There was a period of time where transness was classified as a mental illness by the World Health Organization. So transness was quite literally defined as a disability. And the same with a lot of people of colour. Under white supremacy, people of colour have been defined as genetically inferior and disability has been used in conjunction with racism to subjugate those people. And I was saying all of that, and TikTok did not like that I said that. (laughs) God. Yikes. I mean, all extremely valid points, though. Yeah. TikTok doesn't like the idea that anyone can become disabled at any given time. I think a lot of people have difficulty with conceiving of that, because I think there is just that us versus them attitude. But it is amazing sometimes just seeing the vitriol that people have. Example that's coming to mind, I just saw the new Spider-Verse, and I promise I won't spoil anything. But it had a brief cameo of Sun Spider, who was a disabled artist, Spider-Sona, 
when everyone was drawing their own selves as Spider-Man, who then got a comic. But there was such a backlash and everyone was like, oh, this is just so stupid. Like, there's no way that this could possibly happen. And it is that thing of Spider-Man is such a stupid concept. A guy who was bitten by a radioactive spider and now he can shoot webs out of his hands. Like, I love Spider-Man with all my heart. I need to say that. But like... <laughs> Why is this where we're drawing the line? A spider person can't have EDS. I've had some interesting conversations with people over the past couple of years about the disabled superhero trope versus disabled Mm. superheroes. In a lot of iterations of the comics, Hawkeye has hearing aids. Then you have Daredevil, who very much walks the line of sometimes this is really offensive and sometimes it's fine. There's not a lot of times when Daredevil is good vision impairment rep. They do occur, but more often than not, people are like, oh my god, Daredevil is superhuman, which has always reflected badly back on people with vision impairments. I feel like Daredevil falls into that disability as symbol thing, where the narrator doesn't really want to treat him as disabled. And it could be so interesting if they actually treated Daredevil as a disabled character, because sometimes there's like tiny moments where they do something interesting and actually explore disability. And then they go, oh, no, now here's a ninja fight scene. I remember doing a video probably over a year and a half ago at this point about Doc Ock, the lizard, and Mr. Freeze. Mm. Because they're all scientist characters who are, in one way or another, trying to cure some kind of illness or disability or provide a mobility. I feel like they bring up a very interesting conversation because... In some ways, they are trying to cure and get rid of disability, but in other ways, it's more of a conversation about the hubris of man and not trying to erase things that are natural and occur naturally, like limb loss or chronic illness. Yeah, I can read as very sort of Frankenstein. Mm. But then I think arguably there are some ableist tropes in the way that they're villainized. Doc Ock's prosthetics are very much tied to his villainy. Arguably the scaly appearance of lizard skin as a facial difference. Going back to EDS for a second, because that was brought up very briefly. I recently DNF'd Fourth Wing because I only got 4% of the way in and then I was like, oh, that's too much romance for me. I'm done. Goodbye. I had no idea the main character had EDS. And then I saw a review about it and I went, what? Sorry, hang on. My disability in a book? Um, Okay, maybe I'm going to read it then. But I had a bunch of co-workers who had also read the book and I'd never heard any mention of it, basically. It was all, oh, it's a romance. Oh, it's got dragons. Oh, it's terrible. Oh, it's great. And there was no mention of the fact that the main character was disabled. And that just blew my mind. I had a bit of a rant about it in my video the other day. Where I was like, why aren't people saying that Violet is disabled? Because it underpins so much of her character. It underpins so many of her decisions. Whenever she's going through things, she's thinking about, okay, how do I manage my pain? How do I manage my balance? How do I manage the fact that people feel think I'm weak because I'm disabled? How do I not let certain people know that I'm disabled in case they use it against me? And then to see abled people saying Violet shouldn't be disabled because it doesn't mean anything to her character was ridiculous when literally every disabled person I've seen read this book has been like, this is a fantastic portrayal of disability and shows all of the nuanced and small ways that we think about disability in everything we do. I am actually going to have to go back and read it. I was audio booking it and then the love interest was introduced and I went, no, (laughs) goodbye. (laughs) Folding is one of those that like, I don't think it's a well-written book. I'll never tell anyone that it's a well-written book, but it's a good time and the disability rep is great. (laughs) It's like back in the day when we were all like, oh, there's a gay character in it. I've never read this genre before, but here we go. I will read awful things just to get that representation. Especially something so specific. It's hard to find. Yeah, it's so rare to see EDS rep in anything. And so that's why I was so excited because I was like, oh my God, EDS rep? This is one I don't see often. But... To bring it back to weird reviews of disabled books in general, Mm. I feel like there's so many able people who just do not know how to talk about disabled books in the way that they will often not mention that characters are disabled because it was months before I heard anyone mention that Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow had a disabled main character. That's the first time I'm hearing it. 
It was ages before I heard Iron Widow had a disabled main character. Yeah, that's a really good point as well. I didn't think I knew it until I read it, and I'd heard lots about the poly and lots about the race rap. Exactly, but no one mentions disability. I had a conversation with someone the other day where I was saying that a book like Six of Crows would be just as popular if it wasn't disabled, but it would be nowhere near as popular if there wasn't queer rap in it, and how a lot of people pick and choose which marginalised identities are important to them, and disability tends to be one that they don't care about. Yeah, and I think a lot of that is just because it's not aesthetically pleasing a lot of the time. I feel like it's almost this going too far thing with abled reviewers sort of being like, oh, I don't want to make it all about the disabilities, I'm just going to not talk about it because like they're just characters, and I'm just seeing characters rather than disabilities, which, you know, walks into very iffy territory almost immediately. If they looked more at like non-fiction stuff and like how to actually talk about disability, it'd be easier for them to talk about it, but they don't do that because they aren't. I don't want to be like, they aren't interested, but... They're not. <laughs> And I think a lot of people are worried to say the wrong thing or their opinion is like, I can't speak on this because I'm not disabled or I don't have this disability. Say you're neurodivergent and the disability in the book is physical. There are some similarities between the ableism and the neurodivergent space and the ableism that physically disabled people face, but there are also a lot of differences. And so I can understand why people might not want to speak on the rep specifically. Stating that it's there is just a fact about the book. Exactly. You can't get that wrong. (laughs) I think another area, which in Fourth Wing I noticed this, was disability and sex. Rarely talked about. And it's part of the reason why Fourth Wing was so important to me is because it has sex scenes in it. Violet does have to think about how her body is going to cope with sex. And similarly in Godkiller, there is a sex scene in Godkiller. There are discussions in that scene about Kisson's accommodations and what she needs when she has sex. And I was scrolling through some reviews on Goodreads of Godkiller and someone called that conversation disgusting. They were like, I can't believe he asked if she wanted to take her leg off when they had sex. And it's like, that is just a conversation that amputees have to have. It's just practical. It's like the same as, do you want to lie on the bed or do you want to do it on the floor? Like, it's the same kind of thing. I do love when those conversations are included, though, in Queer Principles of Kit Webb. And also in Marion Hayes, there's a lot of discussion about sex with both Kit's needs and Marion's needs being taken into account. And it can be fun, the scene in Kit Webb where Kit and Percy are getting very steamy in the woods and then Kit's like, we're not f***ing in the woods. My leg will never move again. We have to go home. I read that and I was like, big mood. Big mood. Might be romantic and dramatic, but it is not practical. And I love scenes like that. And I think a lot of able people don't understand the importance of scenes like that existing because so often disabled people are infantilized or told that no one is ever going to want to have sex with us unless they're pitting us or fetishizing us, which isn't true. There are people who, in perfectly normal and healthy ways, want to <laughs> disable people. Completely. Consent conversations used to not really be a thing in fiction. And I mm. feel like that's almost an aspect of this. It was the simplified thing at the beginning of, like, is everyone saying yes? But that's an oversimplification and it lacks nuance because everyone's needs in a sexual context are different, regardless of whether you're disabled or abled. Just because you have one partner who's fine with something, another partner might not be able to do that or want to do that. Can I jump ahead to specific representations I hate? I have one specific one that I'm here to talk about today, and it's the Alex Ryder books. Because I have also been reading Disfigured by Amanda LeDuc. It talks about how a lot of books, specifically fairy tales, see disability as a way to make a character memorable. And that is how the writer of Alex Ryder, Anthony Horowitz, treats disability. Specifically, every single one of his villains has a different disability so that you remember the different villains in the different books. And he has admitted this, that this is the reason he won't stop giving them disabilities, because you have to make them memorable. So each one has a different disability. There is so much wrong with that book series. But this especially absolutely boils my blood because it's just an active use of such a damaging trope. And these are kids' books that are very widely read. Yeah, that's the Alex Ryder rant. It makes me so furious. I don't know how you would admit I only write disabled villains to make them memorable without realising that you're just saying, I am a bad writer. I cannot think of any way (laughs) to make my villains memorable. Like, hello, disability is not a trope for you to use. That's also up there as one of my pet peeves. But yeah, I feel like the prevalence of, even in series I really love, I'm thinking of Percy Jackson, Luke Scar is very much connected to his villainy. I feel like facial differences in particular, I can't think of 
any heroes really with significant facial differences apart from when it's about that like a book like wonder the middle grade book or a hero can have like a dashing little scar or something but the protagonist with significant facial scarring or facial paralysis or anything like that i just simply can't name any I think a few do exist, but they're all middle-aged white men in fantasy where the scar is just there to make them look grizzled and haggard and exactly. I am a badass man <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah, the eyebrow scar and the bridge of the nose scar. Those are the two sexy ones. Or the one that goes like through the corner of your mouth. Not to mention Harry Potter for a sec, but even the lack of nose that Voldemort has, how that makes him look snake-like, which is inherently villainous. I mean, Rowling on disability is egregious. I could spend so long going into it. <laughs> the universal blanket magical cure, the everything about Remus Lupin, the way that disabled characters are treated in her narratives are always through the lens of the abled characters. Mm. Remus leaving is just, oh, this is terrible for us because you're the only good teacher. And it's like he's being wrongly made homeless and jobless because of his disability. Or he's dangerous because of his disability. Yeah, and he's also in massive pain. Yeah. Can we afford some brain power to his side of the story here? I cannot speak spend too long talking about the way that J.K. Rowling does disability, otherwise I'll start screaming, particularly when it comes to Mad-Eye Moody. Oh god, The name in itself. (laughs) Another example of connecting the disability to the villainy with Crouch and then backpedaling, but again, the thing that was unsettling for the kids was the prosthetic eye. Coming back to disability rep that we hated, one of my other notable ones I hated this year was Shield Maiden by Sharon Emmerichs. Oh no, that's on my ATBR. Get rid of it. (laughs) Tell me everything. It hugely infantilizes the main character for like Mm. the whole book. She has an amount of internalized ableism that I personally think is excessive because it's every other paragraph and it's in sentences where it's not contributing to an overall discussion about internalized ableism and working through it. It's just there. And then the love interest starts showing interest in her and it vanishes almost entirely. In a scene which is supposed to be like really romantic and cute, he calls her disfigured hand a little hand. But then every character around her treats her as weak and frail and like an innocent little flower that needs to be protected. And in doing that, they excuse a lot of her behaviour where... She's complicit in racism and slavery. And they're like, oh, it's fine that you're not really dealing with this because you're poor, innocent, disabled girl. Gosh. Yeah, we're okay, that's good. Yeah, it was so bad. That makes me think of, I don't know if this is true of Shield Maiden, but I feel like one thing that seems to be repeatedly problematic with disability sharp fiction that I read, it's like the old queer rap problem that there's just only one character. And it would be so nice to see more of disabled communities in fiction. I'm reading The Bedlam Stacks at the moment, which I'm only halfway through, which is wild and magical realism. I'm not entirely sure I have an opinion on it yet (laughs) in terms of how the disability rep works. But one thing I am finding really refreshing is that the protagonist is a disabled man who ends up in this society, which is entirely made up of disabled people. The way that he's navigating his own internalised ableism and seeing how this society functions and using the magic for disability aids that don't fix everything, but do still help. Having been recently disabled I, I'm not uh, I don't know I've had celiac disease forever which I guess kind of counts but then some of the diagnosis are new hanging out with other disabled people has been very healing in that way so I think mm. it would be very nice seeing that we flock together as well this is the whole thing of like it's unrealistic to have a single gay character because we flock together it's unrealistic to have a single disabled character like I don't go looking for disabled friends but I'm like oh yeah these people are all like able-bodied and then they'll be like oh yeah so my joint went the other night and I'm like your joint went the other night my joint went the other night oh my god It's especially with neurodivergent people. I saw a video on TikTok earlier that was like, it's not that everyone in the world suddenly thinks they're autistic. It's that TikTok is an app built for people with autism and ADHD, and that's why we're all here. I think also the thing with disability where people are like, oh, where did all these people come from? I think an element of it is just like the internet works better now. People who are housebound are actually able to connect with people. Yeah. A book that does do disabled community very well, though, is God Killer. I love it so much. So good. Because God Killer is probably one of the first fiction books I've read that has such a focus on disabled people forming community. Two disabled people 
falling for each other as well. Not a lot of romantic subplots that focus on disabled people have disabled people falling for each other and discussing both of their access needs. It's usually an able-bodied, neurotypical, mentally healthy person who is with someone who is not that. (laughs) Which can so easily cascade into like saviory tropes. Yes. So refreshing from that point of view. Yeah. I remember when we first started reading that book and the only thing I'd heard was that the main character had a disability. And then I went in and just every character we met had a different disability and they were all realistic and explored. Hannah herself isn't disabled. Is she not? That really surprises me. So the first time I met Hannah was a couple of weeks ago. Just after the book had come out, she was doing a book club signing in Leeds. So I went to meet her and she said, yeah, I'm not disabled. I had two sensitivity editors. So the entire time she was writing it from the ground up, she had disabled people involved in the process of making the representation accurate, Mm. particularly for the PTSD and the amputated limb. I think they were own voices, sensitivity editors, one for each, and then the other ones She also outsourced help from sensitivity readers who were different people from her sensitivity editors. She put a lot of thought and care into getting the disability rep right for this book, which I love her for. I think it absolutely comes through. It's why I have complicated feelings about the term own voices when it comes to books about disability. Because Mm. Shield Maiden has a disabled author and Godkiller doesn't. And Shield Maiden was ridiculously offensive and Godkiller wasn't. There are a lot of disabled people who have not worked through internalised ableism and often perpetuate society's ableism just as badly as abled writers do. The difference is not always about lived experience. It is about putting in work both on yourself and on your writing. And I think also if you're only looking for own voices content, then you're kind of giving every abled writer a get out of jail free card to just never write disabled characters. Yeah. Which <laughs> they don't want to do anyway. <laughs> which they don't want to do anyway, but they definitely should be doing. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> And I suppose there's also the factor of I guess this is also its own nuanced and complicated issue. But if you're a writer writing a disabled character, you might not necessarily want to disclose your disability. Mm. That's why a lot of the time when I'm calling out the behaviour of abled authors in general or abled reviewers in general, I try and keep it very generalised because the people who do it know whether they're abled or not. I don't know whether you're abled or not. So I'm going to say like this is an abled attitude or this is an ableist attitude rather than saying abled people are doing this a lot of the time because you just don't know. I've seen people being like, I'm a disabled reviewer and I thought the rep in this was awful, which is perfectly fine to say, but then they'll be invoking really ableist ideas. It's like, so is the rep bad or does it just not fit into the abled idea of disability that you're clinging on to? And you get into some really difficult conversations when you start policing, I guess, people's identities and right to talk about disability. I think there's also a certain level of some disabled people assuming that because they have a disability, they have the cred to talk about all disabilities and be like, I didn't like this because X, Y, Z, when they don't know anything about that particular disability. And they don't know even about how other people experience their own disability because they've just assumed that their own lived experience is enough. And disabled people also need to put in the research and the work. Absolutely. I have multiple disabilities. I have been diagnosed with multiple mental health issues. I'm waiting for diagnoses on autism and ADHD, but every medical professional I've seen is pretty certain that I have both. The chronic pain in my knee is caused by two separate issues. So I have a lot of lived experience of multiple kinds of disability. But also, like, I do a lot of research. I read a lot of nonfiction. I talk to my community I watch TikToks and people talking about their own lived experiences. Like I immerse myself in the community so I know what I'm talking about. But I'm also really just open to being wrong. If I say something about, say, wheelchair users that is just wrong because I'm not a wheelchair user, if I say something wrong, then I'm absolutely open to holding my hands up and being like, that was a mistake. And that, you know, goes for anything. Like if you're a cis gay man, you're not going to know the experience of a trans woman. And especially when you're bringing in intersectionality, if they're a person of colour or if they're also disabled on top of that, all of those things are going to feed into each other and make the picture more complicated. Yeah, 
I do try and impress upon people as well. I'm a white disabled person. My experience with disability is very different to people of color's experience with disability, particularly black people, as there are still so many racist ideas around black people's level of pain and things like that. Mm. Doctors haven't been taught how these illnesses show up in black people. They struggle to get diagnosed a lot more than white people do. And so I always try and impress upon people like my experience and understanding of disability is from a white perspective. And that is probably one of the biggest areas where I'll often get it wrong. On the subject of fiction, I would also love to see more disabled characters of colour because I feel like a fair amount of the ones we've talked about have been white. Oh, a book that I really like that I was going to try and talk about, A Song of Wraiths and Ruin by Rosanne mm-hmm. Brown, which is the first time I saw migraines in a main character. And that is an African-inspired fantasy. And it's just so interesting because it is something that the character deals with throughout the whole book. And it's very integral to their character, especially seeing disabilities that wouldn't have been diagnosed. So people sort of come up with ways to describe them that aren't modern explanations in fantasy world and it's really interesting to see how they're still recognizable yeah it's interesting i think this was also in disfigured i'm trying to remember i've been like reading so many random things over the last few days (laughs) there was a discussion there i believe about how not specifying a disability takes off that commitment to necessarily portray it accurately and it's interesting because i guess fantasy in particular maybe some science fiction kind of has an excuse to not label it in the way that we would if it's second world or a speculative setting because they wouldn't conceive of it in the same way. But I feel like you can tell quite often when a character is written to just sort of be nebulously sickly or disabled and they're kind of coughing up blood when it's conveniently dramatic (laughs) to the plot line. Or when someone has written it being like, okay, this is what they have. They're not going to say that this is what they have because they don't have that word or they don't have the medical understanding. Mm. But I, as the author, know that this is what they have and I'm going to write it from that perspective. Teeny tiny counterpoint to that one. Coming at it from my own writing perspective... I have never given any of my characters specific disabilities or neurodivergencies because I have just written my own experience, not understanding what the symptoms you're writing are, but knowing that there is something there that you are writing about, but not having the language for it yourself. And even with enough research, still not being sure what labels, what category and what is different disabilities, because I have quite a few. So sort of not knowing which ones you're trying to portray and so just throw them all at the wall and seeing what sticks. I think there is space for that in fiction as well. Absolutely. The privilege of diagnosis is important to consider. So what would you guys like to see more of? Someone in one of my comment sections ages ago said that they were writing a fantasy book about guide dragons, like blind people who had guide dragons instead of guide dogs. And so... I want more books that get creative with mobility aids and access needs and work out how that fits into a fantasy setting. Because, yeah, I want emotional support fantasy creatures. I want wheelchairs that are pulled by magical creatures and stuff like that. That's so cool. I immediately want to read this. I know. I've not heard from them since, so I don't know if it's still being written, but like, I want it. (laughs) I want to see disabled people in apocalypse scenarios. Specifically, Mm -hmm. I want more disabled people in zombie apocalypses. I love zombie apocalypses. It's one of my special interests. I just want to see more disabled people coping in that and like disabled people forming community and looking after each other because whenever conversations of like, how would you survive an apocalypse comes up, People always assume, oh, you won't survive because you can't run away from the zombies. You have certain healthcare needs. As soon as society collapses, you can't have those met. So I want post-apocalypse books, most particularly zombie books, that explore how do you provide for disabled people when the Yeah, I feel like I talk to a lot of disabled people who honestly do just go with the like, I would just die, like I just don't want to do it. I've made that joke myself and I can see where it comes from, but I also wonder if it partially comes from an attitude of internalised ableism. Disabled people do have skills that abled people might not have. If you've lent on community before, and you probably have those skills, who knows, maybe you'd be better at it. Yeah. It's a real possibility. You just come into so many interesting conversations, especially if you run into abled survivors, because mm-hmm. then you'd be dealing with like their ableism and them thinking like, oh, I inherently deserve to survive more. Yes. You could have so many interesting conversations that show what society is already like to disabled people, but how it takes the tiniest bit of pressure for abled people to throw us away. Morgan, do you have anything? More. Just more. Just more. 
<laughs> that's that's the whole review. Just just more, please. Yeah, more diversity within disabilities. Mm. We have the classic fantasy setting. We've got a person with an eye missing, a person with a teeny tiny facial yeah. scar, you know, and more disabilities that aren't necessarily acquired because there was a war, mm-hmm. for example. More, I was born like this, or I had a disease when I was nine, or where did this come from? But I'm disabled now. Because sometimes disability just happens to you. In terms of specific disabilities, dwarfism mm. is one I've noticed is not anywhere. Yeah. And especially with the cancelling and subsequent removal from Disney Plus of Willow, it's become startlingly obvious how little dwarfism representation there is in almost all forms of media. Yeah, that is an exceedingly rare one. One I was thinking about was Down syndrome as well. Yes. Especially in fantasy and sci-fi. I think you could write the best Legends of Marte style cosy fantasy about person with Down syndrome. More exploration of hearing loss and eyesight loss as actually being disabilities rather than just being Mm. facts of life. Mm. I was looking through lists before this of fantasy books with disabled characters in them. One of them was The Raven Boys, but the thing that was listed was limp and mobility issues. And I cannot remember a single character in that book who had that. My brain goes, Adam. That's what I was immediately thinking. Loses hearing in one of his ears at the end of book one. And it's very important to his character arc for the whole series. And it just wasn't mentioned. I think it's Gamzy. It's been a while since I read them. Also, like, Adam literally has PTSD. That too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, the PTSD. Like, it's a major plot point that he has PTSD. <laughs> yeah, I want more books where disability isn't the main plot. Kind of like what we've been screaming about for years with queerness. We just want queer people to exist in these books. I want disabled people to just be able to exist in these books. And ride slash fight dragons. And ride slash fight dragons. <laughs> Do we have any specific recommendations for disabled science fiction or fantasy that we've loved? God Killer Every Time is my favourite book of the year. I love it to the ends of the earth. Black Sun by Rebecca Roanhorse. Fantastic, fantastic book. Hugely underrated one. I think I've only ever seen like one other person talk about is After the Dragons by Cynthia Shang, which is a queer kind of mixture between climate sci-fi and cozy fantasy. Sounds weird, but it works. Set in Beijing about two queer boys who are looking after dragons and one of them has pulmonary issues because of the pollution in futuristic Beijing. It's a novella. It's fantastic. It's really short. And then for nonfiction, I have to go with my favourite disability nonfiction, which is Care Work by Leah Lakshmi Piepsner, summarizing her, which is about how disabled people form communities with each other and how we can help uplift each other in a really ableist world. The thing is, I have so many disabled book recs that I'm just like, I need to narrow them down, otherwise we'll be here for another hour. If you're listening to this and you're looking for more disabled recs, (laughs) Elle's TikTok page is exactly where you want to go. (laughs) I do talk about a lot of disabled books and the good and bad rep in them. Morgan. First off, the Lock Tomb series by Tams and Wyatt. There's so much disability, there's so much exploration, it's so baked into the characters. Harry the Ninth lives forever in my heart in such a strong way. I could go on about that for years, but we do other episodes about that, so I'm not going to go on about it here. The second book I was going to talk about is Vespertine by Margaret Rogerson, which has a physically disabled character. I think she's got bands all over her hands and possibly some of the rest of her body. And she's also very autistic and arrowways coded, in my opinion. I'm not sure, but I think her being arrowways is canon. Perfect. That book is all about her and her revenant friend who is anxious and the two of them just dealing with trauma together. And it's so good. And oh, it changed my life when I read it. And then the other book I'm going to recommend. Actually, no, I've got two more. I'm sorry. I'm going to keep going. First off, middle grade book, Please Return to the Lands of Luxury by John Tilton. The main character, Jane, has memory issues and she can't remember a lot of bits of her life. And then she discovers that actually she's living on a trash island and that there's a whole world who don't even know that people live on this island where they just dump their stuff. I've never seen middle grade books explore memory issues before and that was really lovely to see. And then the last book I'm going to talk about is The Murderbot Diaries by Martha Wells, which I've just started reading. I'm on book four. I've gone really crazy with it. There's the whole conversation to be had about the fact that the only disability or autistic or non-binary rep that you see in media is aliens and robots. But Murderbot is so autistic and I relate to it 
on such a deeply fundamental level, it finds it hard to make eye contact and to talk to people and it just wants to watch TV and it literally filters its entire life through its favourite TV show. It literally has to use cameras around the room in order to not make eye contact. It just goes stands in a corner whilst it talks to people and I literally love it so much. Yeah, for me, Murderbot is a great example of subverting the harm that a trope often has because... The autistic robot trope can be very harmful, but Murderbot is such a good representation of autism that it's not saying anything harmful. First of all, this is an old favourite of mine, so I have to throw it out there. Deep Life, not the protagonist, but the deaf representation in that is really cool. A lot of people, a large number of the characters are deaf, and I feel like that shows deaf culture in a fantasy setting in a really cool and interesting way. The other things that I'm going to recommend are both technically not books, so I'm cheating, but I'm going to do it anyway. <gasps> One is a webcomic, which to be fair, I think the first volume of it has been published as a book, so. Oh, that counts. Inhibit by Eve Greenwood, which is about a bunch of kids who are sort of in the superpowered equivalent of the foster care system. They're all unable to manage their own power, so they're in like care of the government, but they are all also disabled on top of that. Like literally everybody in that is disabled. There's so many which is so good amongst the protagonists. There's like a deaf character and an amputee and I love them all so much. And it's also incredibly, incredibly queer. So good for this show. And then the last thing is technically not fiction. The Erin Rosenberry comic Fantasy is a Metaphor for the Human Condition, which is about the artist's experience with a traumatic brain injury that left her unable to draw and parallels that with various stories where a fantasy character loses their ability to cast magic. All the conversations we've had about disability allegories in fantasy, I think that one is a very interesting encapsulation of that. I think we're at the end. Thank you so much, Elle, for joining us. If people want to find you, where should they go? If people want to hear more of your voice, see your face. (laughs) You can find me on TikTok and Instagram at ERM Reading. I am on Twitter as well, but I don't really use it. I'll occasionally retweet something about being Arrow or being disabled, and that's about it. (laughs) We will link all of those in the show notes. And it was so lovely to have you. Thank you so much. It's been great. This is so good. Oh god, I feel like we should do more of these first like chat episodes. This is this is only the second one we've done. <laughs> Next time we will be doing Daughters of Sparta by Claire Hayward, which is a Trojan War retelling from the point of view of Clytemnestra and Helen. It's one of the only retellings I found that doesn't hate Helen despite being a feminist retelling. <laughs> and I would die for Claire Hayward at all times. I won't say anything more about it because otherwise I will spoil it too much for Soren. That will be out on the 14th of August and that will kick off our mythology retelling month. Until then, you're always welcome through the bookcase. Don't forget to scratch the cat on the way out. Thank you for listening to The Hidden Bookcase, a production of Plain Up Broad. On this episode, you heard ERM reading, Morgan Greensmith and Soren Briarwood discussing disability representation in science fiction and fantasy with editing by Kit Lovig. A huge thank you to Elle for joining us for this episode. You brought so much insight to this discussion and we had a really wonderful time chatting with you. You can find them at ERM Reading on most social media platforms, including TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, and Goodreads. You can find The Hidden Bookcase on Twitter at Hidden Bookcase and on Instagram, Facebook, Tumblr, and TikTok at Hidden Bookcase Podcast. Find out more about Planar Prod at planarprod.com. Know what we should read next, or want to chat to us about what you thought of this episode's read? You can reach us at thehiddenbookcase at gmail.com or send us a DM on social media. We'd love to hear from you. If you're enjoying The Hidden Bookcase, please consider leaving us a rating or review, or you can always tell a friend how to find us. Your whispers are the best way for bookworms to discover our show. August is Mythology Retellings Month at The Hidden Bookcase. On our next episode, which will be out on Monday, the 14th of August, we'll be discussing Daughters of Sparta by Claire Hayward. We hope to see you then, and in the meantime, you're always welcome through the bookcase.